the year 621, China was ruled by chaos. Warlord fought warlord. No one was safe, not even the emperor. His estates were seized, his subjects murdered, and his son taken hostage. A peasant found the prince's imperial seal and took it to a monastery nearby. The monks resolved to find this wicked warlord and rescue the emperor's son. For despite their peaceful manner, they knew a hundred ways to kill a man. They were the Shaolin, masters of the deadly art of Kung Fu. At the foot of the Songshan Mountains in central China lies a holy temple where monks learn to kill. In the 7th century, the Shaolin Monastery became known for the hardest training of mind and body ever devised. A monk practiced every day, without fail, in rain or heat or snow. At day's end, he would be bruised and bleeding. In time, his fists became as hard as iron. His body could bear the blows of a staff without flinching. He could kill a man with the palm of his hand. This monastery housed a paradox, pacifists who had mastered Kung Fu. Here, the martial arts the monks studied were in harmony with their faith. To follow the Buddhist path of compassion, one must root out evil. Many families sent their sons to the Buddhist monastery to become learned monks and masters of Kung Fu. One boy who appeared at the monk's door was Pu Sheng. But it was not easy to gain entrance. Choosing a master involved showing a measure of great respect, often to the point of begging while on one's knees. If a candidate showed promise, he would be allowed to stay for a time. The masters agreed that Pu Sheng possessed the proper spirit for a warrior monk. Only when the abbot deemed that one had the necessary qualifications to be admitted to those elite ranks would the initiation ceremony be performed, complete with shaving of the head and swearing of an oath in obedience to one's master. The Shaolin Monastery was built in 495 AD beneath the Songshan Mountains, in what would become Hunan province. Legend traces the origins of these warrior monks to the year 527, when a monk named Da Mo traveled from India to Shaolin. Dharmo's teaching was revolutionary. Rejecting the Buddhist scriptures as the way to enlightenment, he advocated discipline and dedication through meditation. Thus could one see with a clear heart one's true nature. His approach became known as Zen. A special tradition outside the scriptures not to depend on books or letters, 
to point directly to the heart of man, to see one's own true nature and become Buddha. Buddhism teaches that suffering is caused by desire. Zen teaches one to empty the mind of desire. In his quest for enlightenment, Dhammo went to live in a cave in the mountains above the monastery. For nine years, he dwelt there in solitary meditation. During this time, to relieve fatigue, he took up daily exercise. Gradually, the techniques he developed, the choreographed movements and deep breathing, evolved into Shaolin Gong Fu, learned skill, or Kung Fu. Following his example, all the monks of Shaolin soon undertook ritual exercise. Centuries of training would leave their mark. Having been accepted into the temple, Pu Sheng began his long apprenticeship by swearing to the three rules and five disciplines of the Shaolin Temple. Thou shalt worship the Buddhist idols. Thou shalt believe in the Buddhist law. Thou shalt respect your masters and fellow disciples. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not indulge in debauchery. Thou shalt not lie. And thou shalt not drink. In a brutal land, a peacekeeper must be pure of heart. The Shaolin monk could use violence only to purge evil. To take up arms otherwise was forbidden. The main aim of those who train in this art is the promotion of health and strength. One must not use it rashly in the solving of daily problems. With this understood, Pu Sheng was initiated into the rudiments of Kung Fu, hours of repetitive movement and deep breathing. Part of Pu Sheng's schooling was learning the history of Shaolin. To master Kung Fu would require unrelenting concentration of mind and body. A lesson reinforced by his master with stories from the past. Many years ago, there was a young apprentice called Tai Gui. When he arrived, instead of teaching him the staff or barehanded fighting, his master made him fill an enormous cauldron with water and told him that every day he was to roll up his sleeves and slap the water with his palms. To begin with, Tai Gui was very unhappy with his task, thinking that he had gone to the monastery to learn the martial arts, not to slap water. Every day, Tai Gui would fill the cauldron and then slap the water in it until it was empty. And then he would fill it again and slap some more. This went on for two whole years. 
After this time, he was permitted to visit his family. Everyone gathered and made great demands on Tai Gui to demonstrate his skills in Shaolin Kung Fu. With his relatives and neighbors nagging him, Tai Gui could take it no longer. Suddenly, getting to his feet, he said, I really have learned nothing, and angrily smashed down on the table with his open hand. The force of the blow was so great that with a crack, the solid wooden table splintered and collapsed. Upon seeing this, everyone realized that the rumors about the Shaolin martial arts were not false. Sparring with the other young monks, Fu Sheng learned a bare-fisted style of boxing that combined defensive blocks with deadly strikes. The techniques were named for the animals whose movements they revered. White crane, snake, tiger, leopard, dragon. Hidden in the inaccessible mountains, or coiled in the unfathomable depths of the sea, the great serpent awaits the time when he slowly rouses himself for activity. He unfolds himself in the storm clouds and washes his mane in the blackness of seething whirlpools. In the dragon style, the monk slithers and writhes to confuse his opponent. He hisses to control his breathing and focus his strength. Then, a burst of power like the sharp slap of a dragon's tail. In the white crane style, the monk is always moving, ceaselessly attacking, imitating the bird's pecking, clawing and flapping. He aims his blows where his opponent is weakest. The eyes, the neck, the armpits, the groin. With a grip of his fingers, he can disable his foe. High in the Songshan Mountains, Hu Sheng visited the cave of Da Mo to pay respect to the great master and seek guidance. Sleep with the body bent like a bow. Walk swiftly like the wind. Sit like a bell. Stand firm like a pine. Once a monk had mastered the five main forms of hand-to-hand -hand combat, he would be taught how to wield the staff. In the hands of a Shaolin warrior, this weapon of defense turned deadly. For him, agile as a cat, it was ideal. Barehanded, a warrior could fend off an attacker or two. Armed with a staff, he could hold off a dozen or more. Brandishing the staff, a monk moved like yet another animal, the monkey. Quick as a bird and hard as a nail, the sword's tempered steel taught the monk 
to temper his mind. He used it to train, not fight. Yet he also learned the halberd and the spear, the broadsword and the dagger, the hammer and the axe, so that on the field of battle he could fight with whatever lay at hand. In the year 621, the time had come for Pu Sheng to put his skill to the test. A cruel warlord had kidnapped the emperor's son, Li Shiming. The monks agreed that the emperor and his son ruled in harmony with the heavens, while the warlord disrupted the country and hurt the people and was nothing more than a simple bandit. With 12 other monks, Pu Sheng set off for the city of Lu Yang, the bandit's lair. The monks split into two groups. Shan Hu, who knew the city, would lead the rescue. The others would steal horses for their escape. Inside the city, their path was blocked. Moving like a cat, Pu Sheng scaled the wall. Below him, a guard paced inside the compound. Pu Sheng leapt upon him like a wild tiger. Outnumbered, knowing they would fight to the death if caught, the other monks followed. Tell us where they keep the prisoner. But guard what you say. One lie, and I will twist the head from your shoulders. They found Li Shiming's cell. He was unconscious, but alive. They left as they had come, like ghosts. The other monks have broken into the stables and stolen horses. With Li Ximin, they broke out of the city and rode for the bridge. The monk Tanzong had stayed behind to kidnap the warlord. Instead, he found the warlord's general in a house of pleasure. Roused from sleep, he struck at Tanzong, but sliced through only shadows. With the speed of a snake's tongue, Tanzong struck him to the ground. With his prisoner, Tanzong joined the others, and they galloped off toward Shaolin. They had not gone far when soldiers could be heard giving chase. Their fast horses were gaining steadily. Just as they were approaching the monks, a group of the emperor's cavalry arrived. Eager for vengeance, the emperor's horsemen raced past the monks and charged the warlord's men. The few who survived turned and fled. When Li Shiming ascended to the throne, he showed his gratitude to the Shaolin monks by inviting them to demonstrate their art. The monks performed with brilliant skill and precision. The crowd was standing, riveted to the spot in silent fascination. And the only sound 
was the hiss and clink of the monk's weapons. A lavish feast was given by the emperor, who sent a stone tablet to Shaolin, inscribed with the names of the brave men who had saved his life. He rewarded the Shaolin temple with an estate and supplies of grain, and permitted its masters to train 500 warrior monks. In centuries to come, the monks would be beseeched time and time again to defend emperors and peasants alike. In 1553, 40 monks armed with staffs routed a band of Japanese pirates. In battle, the monks found courage in their belief in reincarnation, that this life was only one of many to come. After each campaign, the monks returned to their simple life within the Shaolin temple, true to the humble lessons of Buddha. His conduct should be as transparent as ice. He is not to seek fame or wealth. If you rejoice in victory, then you delight in killing. If you delight in killing, you cannot fulfill yourself. After many years of study and training, a monk would set out to wander in the land as the great master Da Mo had done. Each traveled with only a few possessions, his robes, his razor, and a wooden bowl. As they journeyed, the wisdom of their ways spread far throughout China and beyond. Let him be trained in mind and body by walking over the mountains and fording the rivers. Let him befriend men wise in the law of Buddha. Let him brave the snow, tread on the frosty roads, not minding the severity of the weather. Let him cross the waves and penetrate the clouds, chasing away dragons and evil spirits. Thief is about to steal or die trying. Outside the victim's window, a gentle rain shower begins to fall. It seems the roof has sprung a leak. False alarm. But the sword is gone. The novice has passed the test and joins an invisible army, warriors of the night.
central Japan. The year is 1562. The warlord of this castle has taken hostage the wife and son of a rival, Tokugawa Iyasu. To get them back, Iyasu needs hostages of his own. The castle's defenders suspect an attack, but feel secure. Iyasu looks to the key that will unlock the gates, the ninja. In Iyasu's day, hundreds of warlords and thousands of samurai fight for power in Japan. For four centuries, they have been locked in warfare. Far from the din of battle, the most powerful warlords live in luxury. protected by armies of samurai, soldiers prepared to die for their masters. For the samurai, warfare is open, regimented, and honorable. But another kind of warrior stalks Japan, the ninja. Cunning, courageous, and cutthroat. A coded message has been left in the forest. A warlord called Iyasu is willing to pay for the skills of a ninja. The ninja replies, I will come. Ninjutsu. The art of the ninja has thrived in Japan for centuries. Developed from the teachings of Chinese strategists like the great Sun Tzu, it found eager students among Buddhist monks in Japan. To protect their temples, legend has it that the gentle monks taught others to do their fighting. Simple peasants became their protectors. Soon the protectors became warriors for hire. In the neighboring provinces of Iga and Koga, ninjutsu took root. Mountain peaks and valley walls hid farmers by day, ninja by night. In these hills and forests, in small bands or alone, the ninja thrived. Word of their talents has traveled far beyond their sanctuary and reached men like Lord Iyasu. The ninja he has summoned are about to be put to the test. The skills that Iyasu requires are sold for money, but they were first paid for in years of sweat and pain. From a skilled master, a son or daughter learns the secrets of the ninja. Let's get it. 
weapons of attack, tools of siege. These secrets are a rich brew, eagerly drunk drop by drop. Such treasures are handled like jewels, lose them and die. One ninja from Koga wrote to his master. These writings on ninjutsu entrusted to me by you will never be shown to others. If by any chance I should disobey, then I must receive the punishment of heaven. Lessons are grueling. Every move is rehearsed precisely and endlessly. All performed as silently as possible. Is the victim really asleep? Or only pretending, luring the ninja into a trap? This time it's only a game. One day, a matter of life or death. As the young ninja grows, her lessons become more deadly. The shaken, the throwing star, tiny but deadly. To master cold steel, she practices with a wooden pike. The sword itself would forgive no mistake. Nature herself becomes an accomplice. Which creatures cause panic when flung at an enemy? How a box of crickets can camouflage sounds? Which plants to use to treat a wound? The novice's first assignment, assassination. Using three principles of ninjutsu. First, the principle of heaven. Time the attack with care. Months go by before the moment to strike arrives. Second, the principle of earth. Find the enemy's weak spot. The warlord visits his garden each morning to smell the flowers. Last, the principle of mankind. Manipulating how men behave. The next day, when the Lord bends to sniff the blossoms, he collapses and dies. Mixed with the pollen is poison dust. Lord Yasu's call for help is answered by the ninja. Somewhere, a warlord holds Iyasu's wife and son captive. To get them back, Iyasu will seize the warlord's sons. The enemy's castle is too strong to attack. The ninja must slip inside and slip out, undetected. If caught, a ninja must safeguard his secrets by taking his own life. A ninja's life depends on secrecy. 
If the disguise of a farmer or laborer won't do, a ninja chooses that of a priest, a minstrel, a merchant, or a wife. The ninja dresses in brown or black and blends into the darkness. Beneath, she may wear a layer of light armor. The cloth that hides her face has a more vital use. Impregnated with antiseptic, it can become a bandage. Following the principles of warfare, the ninja set out to find the warlord's weak spot. His walls are scaled. His corridors explored, unseen, unheard. His intruders leave as quietly as they came. They have gotten what they came for and lay their plan. Their weapons are as silent as the ninja. The sword is the strongest of its day. The blade is the sharpest ever known. Oiled and polished till it glistens, it is a testament to the skill of two craftsmen, the swordsmith and the assassin. In the hands of a master, it can kill with one blow. Other tools of their trade are pulled from hiding. Daggers, knives, grappling irons, iron knuckles, claws. The guards are wary yet unaware as the ninja once more crossed the moat.
Again, they are unheard, unseen. No one speaks. In stark contrast to the samurai, who proudly shouts his name when he wades into battle, the ninja works in silence. Reach the inner courtyard, still undetected. Mysteriously, a fire breaks out. The garrison is alarmed and distracted. Confusion, the ninja strike. stun their victims with poison powder and spirit them away. Where the ninja had been, there is darkness. By dawn, the castle is ablaze. And Lord Iyasu has his hostages to trade. The ninja have saved his family. One day, they will save his life. Late in the 16th century, Japan is still racked by civil war. In 1581, the province of Iga, sanctuary of the ninja, is attacked from all sides. The land is devastated, the people slaughtered, including many of the ninja. The survivors escape to join their old employer, Iyasu. Lord Iyasu himself is overwhelmed and must flee, guarded by the ninja. They bundle him aboard a ship and hide him among the cargo. His pursuers search for him with their swords. One blade pierces his thigh, but he makes no sound. As it's withdrawn, he wipes it clean of his blood. The ship sails, and Iyasu is free. Iyasu rewards the ninja well by taking 300 into his service. A wise move. 
Those employed by him will not be used against him. To deter the ninja who work for his enemies, Iyasu crafts defenses, hidden doors, false stairs, and the nightingale floorboard, which sings at the slightest step. The warriors of the night serve Iyasu well. So well that within a decade, all of Japan comes under his rule. In 1590, he and his family form the Tokugawa Shogunate, or dictatorship, in Edo, a tiny town later called Tokyo. The nation of Japan is born. For 250 years, the Tokugawa reigned in relative peace. They no longer required the services of the ninja. Some founded schools of ninjutsu and taught the martial arts. Some became bodyguards. A few became bandits. Masters of invisible warfare disappeared, slowly absorbed into time and legend, and the night.